Yeah, I've been around with the Blue Waters for a long time, such that they even let me give a talk, even though I don't have time on Blue Waters anymore it ended at the end of July of 2018. But we've been on the system from the beginning. I've been to all these workshops here, including the ones in Illinois. And I hold two roles at the University of Utah. I direct research computing and also I'm a faculty member there. And what we do is simulation of molecules. Uh, we want to understand their structure dynamics, interactions, and so forth. And a key aspect of this work is reproducibility, that we can get equivalent results uh, with different initial conditions and also convergence. Ultimately, agreement with an experiment. Uh, we started off before Blue Waters with machine uh, long time simulations on Anton. This is a DNA. Oops. That's uh, let me move it. Basically, a long simulation of DNA. You don't see the ions in the water that are in there, and it's been time averaged to kind of get rid of the high frequency motions. Occasionally, if you look in the termini, you can see base pair opening, and the issues we have with how can you converge the conformational distribution depends on the time scale of the events you're trying to probe. So uh, we can easily converge the internal structure of the DNA duplex assuming base pair opening doesn't occur because the internal base pair opening, opening is on a millisecond time scale, much longer than our current simulations. Uh, but we can capture the, the end events. And what does this require? Computing support, people and people resources. We can't just do these kind of things in a vacuum. We need people to help us understand the technologies, help us with the codes. And this happens at both the local level and in the region and nationally. And I've been advocating through, up for these things through the Campus Research Computing Consortium, among others. We have fairly good resources at the University of Utah, about 25,000 cores, about 20 petabytes of disk. I've got about a half a petabyte. I used Exceed for many years. Uh, I was the 17th largest user over the last decade, even though I haven't had an Exceed allocation in three years. Uh, but we moved to Blue Waters approximately uh, five and a half years ago. And we had about four and a half years of allocation through various mechanisms, three PRAC awards and then Ebola Rapid. I've served on the science advisory engineering team for Blue Waters throughout its history. So what do we need to do simulations right? We've got to properly set them up, run, assess, and validate the simulations and, and understand what convergence means in terms of understanding conformational ensembles. And there's a lot of issues. Uh, you've got to get structures, ideally, from the experimental database that are, are well representative. You've got to set it up. You've got to add ions and water and have to have the right force fields. Uh, you've got to equilibrate it so it doesn't blow up. And in some of our early simulations on, on Blue Waters, we would run this nice RNA and it would move to someplace new that turns out it's not at all representative experiment. We tended to use NMR structures that were deposited in the, in the structural data bank. And we started to realize that those structures, which were refined a long time ago in vacuum without proper force fields, were not so stable. Uh, just three examples that I've got uh, here with this particular one. Uh, there were two structures that were known uh, for this particular sequence. The only difference was in the middle. The mismatch of the bases was different. And if you look at the structure on the left and the structure on the right, you don't think they're the same thing. They're, they're not very similar at all. And there's a wide spread in the structures. When we, re we refine these with the simulation, with the restraints that were coming from experiment, with modern force fields, explicit solvent, we now got a tight set of structures. And they're very similar to each other, except in that mismatch region. And that kind of said, well, maybe we have to massage our structures before we simulate them. Another example, uh, two structures are known for this particular RNA sequence, one's a magnesium, uh, one's a structure in the presence of magnesium, one's in the absence. The original NMR showed kind of a wide range of structures that satisfied the restraints. When we re-refined the NMR, we got a very tight structure, and we were able to show in simulation spontaneously we could add magnesium and convert to a magnesium-bound structure. And it turns out that the magnesium-free kind of samples between two conformations, and the magnesium locks it into one. And so that was kind of exciting. And another one more recently was this DNA mini dumbbell. Again, the NMR original structure, if we ran that in simulations, took all the 10 structures were there, they would just blow up. But if we re-refine them, uh, we got a much better uh, representation of it. And force field evolution has happened over the last, since the 80s, but the first really good stable force fields for proteins and nucleic acids came out around 1994. 
We call it the PARM 94, FF 94, Cornell et al. force field. Uh, there's been a lot of variation since then, and it's really a complex alphabet soup that if you go to the literature, it's really hard to figure out which parameter set it's like for DFT, if you're trying to figure out which functional or whatever, it's, it's complicated. Uh, best is to talk to someone who knows, has experience with all these, and they can tell you what's good and what's bad and what's to avoid. But one of the things that we do know here is these charges and van der Waals parameters were set in 1993. And the way you got the van der Waals parameters where you would run a, a neat liquid simulation to reproduce the density. And we were doing this before particle mesh Ewald, which treated the electrostatics correctly. So all the force field van der Waals parameters, which haven't changed since then, are systematically off. They're all a little too sticky um, because they weren't accounting for electrostatics. And this is something we're finally starting to realize more than two decades later, which is kind of crazy. But lots of variants. Uh, things where we play with stacking, tweak the van der Waals to high level QM. Most of the changes were changes to the dihedral parameters. Uh, Boosie's done some nice work where they're using maximum entry me methods to fit to experiment and so forth. Um, we're starting to test polarizable models, but we're not quite there yet. And we found things that were very subtle that water models, which I thought never would have had an influence in the structure, actually have a profound influence. And with new water models, like OPC and the one from David Shaw's lab, um, it actually makes much better fidelity and reproducing of the experimental results. And we've now started to tweak the van der Waals on those particular groups. Now, once we've got it set up, we want to run production MD. And the way we used to do it in the 90s was we'd run a single simulation for as long as we can. And that doesn't really tell you that much because you can't compare it to anything else. So We've now moved where you have to run multiple independent sets of simulations and try to even to apply enhanced sampling methods that speed up the convergence and ideally multiple types of those methods so you can compare them and show that the results are equivalent among them. So we do lots of ensembles of calculations in blue waters, replica exchange MD, multi-dimensional replica exchange where we're changing force field and changing temperature. And this has allowed us to converge the conformational distributions of a variety of different systems Unfortunately, when we converge to conformational distribution, it doesn't match experiment, but I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that today in the case of RNA. With DNA, we do an amazing job. But just kind of a state of where we were. Uh, 2007, you could run a microsecond of simulation. It would take many weeks. Um, and they would say it's not quite converged yet. And when we looked at structures, we would kind of see like with those NMR structures, they're kind of a series of structures that are kind of uh, wobbling around a particular average. Um, more recently, we, we were looking at actually about 2010 timeframe, salt dependence on DNA structure. And the longest simulations people had run to look at salt dependence on DNA structure was about a microsecond, even till this year. And you get a picture like this that looks like, it's hard to say, are those differences in the structures real or representative? And you get these tables of RMSD that make you think there's structural differences with lithium compared to sodium compared to whatever, but it's a complete artifact of not insufficient sampling. Um, we know this because of the Anton runs and the early um, simulations of blue waters and on GPUs. And there's a nice paper by Bernard Knapp that talks about this idea that a single simulation could be very misleading. You want to run lots of copies and then look at kind of the average properties that come out. Okay, so this is what we saw later when we had GPUs on Blue Waters and on Anton. If we took three microsecond average structures and overlaid them, they were essentially identical. No longer were you seeing that spread in those structures. Um, at first, we thought this was an artifact of Anton, but it turned out to be real on this time scale. And now if you do longer simulations of the salt, you can see there's really no influence of salt on the DNA structure in terms of concentration or ion type, with the exception that at five molar salt, you, the grooves compress a little bit. But it, it's, a, it's a little bit worrisome in some sense. Other issues are about the sampling time. The question is, how long do you run your simulation? How do you check if you're done? And it depends on kind of what events you're looking at. One, one problem we have with magnesium in simulations is, is magnesium can bind to phosphates very tightly, about 12 to 15 kcals per mole, which translates to a lifetime of many milliseconds. And if you're running simulations for microseconds, how are you going to exchange them unless you do tricks on the ions and so forth? If you were lucky and the ions got to the right place, 
in the initial part of the simulation, you can get the right behavior. If they're, if they're in the wrong place, you're trapped unless you can overcome these issues. So when are you done? And this is something that, that's been a big focus of our work is kind of assessing convergence. And what I want to see is from independent sets of simulations, measures uh, that can show I get the same results with one simulation as I do with, with another. And I want to show it both in structure and in dynamic space. And so things we often do or we do is combine clustering that our analysis code can do. So you take the independent trajectory data, you put it together, you do the initial clustering, and then you separate the trajectories and calculate the populations of each cluster. If the populations are the same in each of the independent sets, it's pretty good evidence that they sampled the same space. It doesn't guarantee you saw every confirmation because both may not have run long enough to see one particular anomalous state. And same thing with in dynamic space, we can calculate the principal uh, components, principal modes of motion from the trajectories. We put them together, calculate them, and then separately project them. And if they overlap, it's a pretty good indication that the results are equivalent. And uh, oh, this shows an example from uh, the Anton uh, runs we did. We did two different Anton runs for a long period of time. Uh, since it's DNA, uh, the modes of motion are harmonic. The first five are shown, and there's a, a dotted line and a solid line. Essentially, there's complete agreement between uh, the modes of motion. It shows that those two independent trajectories, different initial conditions, different salt placements, and so forth, get the same reproduction of the modes of motion. And if you look at the internal uh, base pairs, uh, we can look at this kolbeck lieber divergence in the, in the difference between the modes of motion. When it gets down to zero, it says there's no difference between uh, the two trajectories. And by five microseconds, it's essentially identical. But if you include all the base pairs, you initially show this nice convergence where they're the same, but then suddenly some of the modes differ between one simulation and the other. And that's because of terminal base pair opening. In one case, uh, the base pair opened. In the other case, it didn't. And even later, here, we had two base pairs open, which caused that third mode of motion to divert and change. So here's from these SALT simulations. You run a SALT simulation and look at the cluster populations first time, and you run just a microsecond time scale. The lines are still crossing. You haven't converged the populations of the different members of the conformational ensemble. By the time you get up to 10, 15 microseconds, they're fairly stable, but they're still not perfectly straight in terms of the populations. So it takes a long time. Uh, to do this work, when we were doing the replica exchange um, runs, we would run like up to hundreds of independent uh, MD simulations that were exchanging information. And when we started to in that, analyze these on the Lustre system, we were doing it from a single node, and it kind of just took out the Lustre file system. And they weren't very happy about that. So we had to parallelize the code so we could do uh, an ensemble per node effectively. So we have parallelization across files, across ensembles, across OpenMP and others. Uh, there's a Python interface to CPP Traj. It's a nice program to do these things. Some new features. Uh, we've got Leonard Jones PME in there for energetic analysis. We had a way to define states. Like if you were doing a membrane simulation, you could say the drug is outside the membrane, it's on the membrane, it's in the membrane, and then you can calculate lifetimes and probabilities and so forth, which is really kind of cool. Um, another thing that's uh, not seen in many analysis codes is we can do what's called the symmetric RMSD. So if you imagine protein simulation of phenylalanine flips, it now looks like a different atom order when you compare them. This corrects for that automatically to get the lowest RMSD. Okay. Paper on the parallelization of CP Trage was finally published in 2018. Um, one of the things we also have to do with replica exchange, if we're doing multi-dimensional replica exchange, your trajectories are written out in a particular format. They're either like per replica or per temperature or per Hamiltonian. But when you want to do the analysis, you want to be able to sort them to get all possible. You want to see properties of a rep each replica, properties at a particular temperature, and properties at a particular Hamiltonian. We had seen we did temperature replica exchange fairly long for the time, but uh, only 24 replicas. Uh, it wasn't fully converged in terms of cluster populations. And when we looked at properties as a function of replica, which is just a measure for each replica, what's the population of confirmations a particular distance away from a reference? And you can see some of these replicas uh, are sampling an anomalous space that the other ones haven't for evidence that we weren't converged there.
OK, so how to validate? This is tricky. And one of the problems we have is there is a conformational ensemble of molecules, particularly in the RNA case. It, it adopts multiple conformations. And one thing that's hard to understand from experiment is what the population of the minor conformers should be. Should they be 1%, 2%, 5%? And it's a very tricky thing. Um, we've been looking towards uh, uh, Maxent methods, along with Sandro Bataro uh, and uh, Linda Florison and Giovanna Bas Busi, where they can kind of reweight to fit experimental observables. Uh, um, unfortunately, it turns out that the difference from when we reweight to what it originally was isn't really that much in terms of populations. Okay. Here's where we're going in the future. I'll, I'm not going to describe the whole slide, but this is where my R01 renewal is about in terms of changing the charges and so forth. I'm going to mention this Amber Hub that uh, the analysis code is actually getting pretty tricky these days to use. It's complicated. Uh, so we've created this web page um, that provides kind of examples on how to do this combined clustering. It's many more than this now. And in all our papers, we put supporting information that provides the input files that allow you to do that kind of analysis. So you can figure it out yourself without um, too much trouble. Um, people in my lab over the number of years, various funding from various uh, places. The Blue Waters time was just phenomenal to allow us to do things. We were one of the few groups that used all our allocation every year almost. Um, and uh, kind of the products, I showed this last year, but you know, we've been, we, the machine didn't come in production to about 2013, I think. Uh, we got more than 50 publications over that time. Amber has evolved from Amber 14 up to Amber 19 now with massive GPU acceleration. Uh, we learned about multidimensional public exchange, paralyzed the analysis codes, compared Amber to Gromax to Charm to Anton and showed they were the same. We refined NMR structures, learned to use longer time steps, showed reproducibility and convergence, and could do force field assessment, validation, and optimization. So that's kind of a whirlwind tour 